that this is work in progress and it consists of two pieces that you will see in a few moments. One is a theoretical concept that I'm developing and then the second is an empirical analysis that tests the hypothesis. So it's going to be long and it's going to be a bit complex and it's very much still work in progress and I'm, I'm going to be super happy to hear any of the comments and feedback and criticisms that you may have because I'm still developing this and feedback will be very useful. So I am uh, would like to acknowledge my co-author Susie Lee who is an anthropologist and has joined us here at the Max Planck Institute a few months ago and she's working with me on trying to realize the emotional demography uh, and the examination of how emotion may affect or drive fertility preferences and behavior. So this piece is called Emotion and Fertility in Times of Disaster and tries to conceptualize the fertility response to the current pandemic. Uh, I'm sure you all heard enough of it, uh, too much of it, all the debates in the press and everywhere, what's going to happen to fertility in response to the pandemic, a baby boom, a baby bust, both of it, we don't know. Um, there is broad agreement among the press and I think lay people and demographers that the, the, the pandemic will likely affect fertility in a profound way, but we are not quite sure yet how and, and for how long and uh, where and so on. And there are some first results. You may have seen this paper, which is an analysis by Thomas Sobotka and colleagues which was, I think, uploaded to a Pilgrim server a few weeks ago. And they show, in comparison to last year's fertility rate in a selected set of countries, that uh, the fertility that was created or conceived after the start of the pandemic in roughly March 2020, uh, which is indicated by this red uh, bar that I have added to the graph from Tomasz, um, there is a variation in how countries have responded in terms of uh, fertility behavior to the pandemic. There are huge declines in Spain, also not in here, Italy, France, some East Asian countries, but then other countries have had no declines, for example, Scandinavia, also Germany, not, which is, uh, and Austria, not, no declines, which is not in this graph. So there's quite a bit of variation. And uh, of course, uh, there is the, the debate of, of why that is and um, why fertility is affected by disasters and how it is affected by disasters. And there have been many previous studies on a variety of disasters, not only the flu pandemic or um, earthquakes or wars or recessions. And the general pattern that you all know that has been observed is that generally fertility declines uh, fast in response to disaster and then is followed by rebound. But yet there is notable variation as we've just seen also across the world right now in how this response look like, looks like and whether there is the bust uh, and whether there is the rebound and for how long it lasts and so on and so forth. So generally speaking, um, the fertility disaster response literature is mimicking the question that we generally have in fertility research, which is why does fertility vary and which are the factors specifically in terms of the disaster fertility response that mediate and moderate how fertility looks like in, in response to the disaster. Um, there are many, many predictors or, or variables that are studied to predict fertility and in terms of the disasters, there are four specific theories or mechanisms that have been proposed and studied to explain the fertility response to disasters, which is the idea of replacement fertility, so to replace life that has been lost by a shock. Physiological mechanisms, for example, uh, stress that, that causes temporal infecundity or also um, after the death of a child, the sudden uh, stop to lactating, which may cause a, a ovulation to come and a, a faster childbirth than would have been expected otherwise. Then there have been uh, the insurance effects discussed that people are afraid of 
further human losses and, and just to lose more children. Also to make sure that if the disaster strikes again, they won't, uh, uh, they still have enough children basically to, to, um, to, to, to continue on uh, with humanity. And then one uh, mechanism that is very prominently discussed right now is the economic uncertainty approach, but generally the uncertainty approach, but often it's discussed jointly with economic uncertainty that uh, the recession that is brought about by this specific pandemic or generally disasters uh, causes such an uncertainty in terms of what will come uh, that, that people hold back and delay further childbearing. So uh, in terms specifically of the economic uncertainty uh, hypothesis, there, there is literature that shows that both economic conditions and also uncertainty perceptions effects vary on fertility responses, regionally speaking, or they are contingent on the subjective well being. And the authors of those papers are in the audience. <laughs> That'd be nice. Um, but it's often not still really clear uh, what the, the mechanism that underlies this variation or that moderates these uh, perceptions really is. And that is where we come in and say, well, there is emotion. And uh, that may be the big puzzle piece that we are missing in understanding what mediates and moderates generally how people decide or behave in terms of reproducing um, or create their preferences, uh, and specifically also in response to disasters. So what we propose here is that what happens specifically a disaster or the effect of a disaster, affects fertility behavior systematically via how people feel about it. Um, it may sound very simplistic and in a way it is, uh, yet I think it's quite important and profound. Um, emotion uh, in affective sciences, so the interdisciplinary group of, of people from psychology and different um, neurobiology, different areas that, that study human decision-making and behavior also uh, from an evolutionary perspective argue that emotion is quite profoundly guiding uh, human behavior and decision-making. But demography and specifically the literature on fertility has not yet much integrated psychological approaches and mechanisms, generally speaking, and emotion specifically. So, uh, why is emotion perhaps particularly important to study in terms of the fertility response to disasters and this pandemic? We, we argue that um, uncertainty, which we have now, increases uh, the importance of effect, which is like emotion, emotional uh, or feelings in, in decision making that has been shown in psychology. And we specifically focus uh, in this particular concept and work on the negative emotions, it's called negative uh, valence emotions with negative effects like anxiety, sadness, anger, uh, because we argue that the negative effect sharply increases during times of crisis and disasters, and specifically also now in the pandemic, which has been uh, shown right now, depression is increasing, um, which is probably closely related to, to the negative emotion increases. Uh, and we particularly are interested in exploring this link between negative affect, negative emotion, and fertility responses. So the aim of our study really is to propose a conceptual model of how emotion affects fertility, um, both by affecting the preferences and the behaviors during times of disaster. And as I just said, we are focusing on this partic particular concept we're developing, developing on the negative balance emotion. Then the second step will be to empirically test the hypotheses we are developing here with the data set that uh, fits uh, surprisingly well. It's been like a coincidence that they collected it in a way that fits our theoretical ideas, uh, which is the pair from panel, they have, I will talk more about this data connection later. They, but the, the basic idea is to examine the change in fertility desires between the weight that was collected pre-COVID in 2018-19 at the turn of the year 
to fertility desires that were collected in 2020 after the first lockdown contingent on how people felt during the first lockdown in Germany, which was me measured in an additional um, out of cycle panel wave that is called the COVID wave. So that's what I'm expecting you right now here. Um, and before I go into the data part, I will talk a bit more about our theoretical ideas and then move on to the empirical part. So um, we will latch on later in our model to the uncertainty hypothesis I just talked about a little earlier. Um, but we will also develop or put forward two contrasting models, theoretical conceptual models that are derived from evolutionary theory and the effective sciences. And in evolutionary theory, uh, you may have heard um, about a concept that is called terminal investments. That's uh, a very straightforward idea, actually, that argues that the terminal investment uh, or the, the hypothesis proposes that a decreased expectation of future reproduction, for example, in a mortality threat situation, um, should cause an, an increased investment in current reproduction. The idea behind this is that a threat to life or a threat um, to well being that is sudden may. Uh, give the, the individual the feeling of uh, a, a shortened lifespan and triggers it into, into action to reproduce, so to use the time wisely to still, still reproduce as long as it's possible. That is often tested in animals. Um, it's, I, I think, a general idea that, that has been developed generally in evolutionary theory in terms of uh, life and reproduction in general. And there are quite some papers that actually uh, show evidence for, for this uh, hypothesis to be true in, in animal models. So we, we use this and, and argue that the negative emotion that is felt suddenly and increasingly during times of disasters, for example, anxiety, anger, or sadness, serve as an ignition switch, which triggers reproductive investments in a threat to life disaster situation. The, the second uh, idea we are, we are leaning on uh, comes from the effective sciences that argue that emotion uh, profoundly affect human decision making. And they are, this is a very young science there are a few models proposed, uh, as far as I understand the literature, but I'm very happy to learn more from you or the psychologists here in, in the Zoom room. Uh, there is no unified theory of how emotion may uh, affect decision making. And there are a variety of approaches and ideas, and we lean on three, specifically the first one, which is called integral emotion which basically posits that the emotion you feel in the moment of decision making that is very specifically attached to a certain thing you are trying to decide on or behaving on will affect how you decide. So for example, somebody who uh, is considering having another child and is spending time at home in the lockdown and is extremely frustrated with the school, school closures and stressed by their own children and uh, feels much negative emotion related to child rearing may rather decrease the intention to have another child soon or the intensity of that intention or refrain from sexual behaviors that would cause a pregnancy to be conceived. Uh, this is the idea of the integral emotion and the effective model that we pro propose. Then the second uh, is rather arguing um, in the effective sciences that emotion trigger or activate goals, which fits very well with the terminal investment, that the anxiety that is felt as a threat to life may actually heighten the desire to reproduce as long as there is still time. Then the third is the idea of the goal-directed processes that emotion affects um, decision-making through uh, affecting uh, the thinking of how the process will, will look like in the future. And we argue that this uh, is, is going well with the uncertainty model. So we say um, the integral emotion fits best to this effective model, the terminal investment evolutionary theory 
serves as goal activation and the goal directed emotional processes are uh, rather um, affecting fertility behaviors through this uncertainty model. So I already talked about the effective model and the specific positive or negative emotion that would have to be measured regarding specific things like the partner, children, family life, uh, will positively or negatively affect the preferences and sexual behaviors uh, instantly, more or less. That's the idea. They can also accumulate within a shorter time window. Then the second idea with the term investment is that generally speaking, negative strong emotion that is triggered by a threat will in a more subconscious way actually trigger reprodu reproductive investments or preferences. And this can be very generalized emotions like anxiety, or it can be a special threat perception, for example, to own health or the health of members in the community. Then the uncertainty model, we say specific anxiety and worry related to, in terms of the economic uncertainty, economic conditions or future threats to survival, for example, to health and stability in the community will lead to a decline in fertility preferences. That's the idea. So um, for the moment, that's, that's enough background um, regarding the theoretical ideas we propose. I will talk a bit about the data and the analysis and then come back to present some more specific hypotheses that we developed based on the data that is available and we have found before I presented the results. So keep this in mind. I'll come back to it in a bit. So I talked about the care fund data which is the panel analysis of intimate relationships and family dynamics, a panel that has been collected yearly in Germany since 2008. You see here a schema that they have on their website about on, on the waves, the, the white box in the middle, anchor person, that is the main focal person that they collect data on every year. And then there are some additional surveys of the people's partners and the children and the parents. We disregard all of these colored boxes. We're just interested in this anchor information for the moment and uh, move a bit forward in time to the wave 12, which has been collected as the most recent wave. It's, it's not fully available yet, but we were lucky enough to get some snapshot of the data in advance so we can do these analysis for PAA. The wave 12 was collected in the winter of 2019 and the spring of 2020. It always starts in November and then they go over the turn of the year and keep collecting into the spring. And they had collected, I think, about two thirds or so of that wave or a bit more when COVID came in to play. And the first lockdown um, started mid-March in Germany. So this data collection, I think, is face to face. It got interrupted because of this. And, and paused. And meanwhile, they postponed the finalization of the collection of the wave. They came up with the idea to have an extra wave that is collected uh, with different questions than the normal wave about, it's a short survey about how people felt during the lockdown and what they did and how, how, how they were bearing. So the invitation to this extra COVID wave that got sent out to all the panel members. And I think about 3,500 or so responded, which is less than half of, of the sample, but it's a good chunk of, of the panel members. Uh, this got collected, it was an online survey in a short amount of time here between March and May. Uh, and then the wave 12 got finalized. I'm not sure if it was collected again face to face or then they switched to online. That info isn't yet available because the wave isn't out yet uh, officially. But there is a good chunk of people who responded to the wave 12 in or after between May and July 2020. And this is the sample we're interested in. So in all the waves, they have a question on fertility desires and uh, that is repeated yearly, which is our core interest uh, outcome of interest that we will analyze because fertility behavior and fertility isn't available yet. So we are interested in changes in preferences from before to after COVID as a function of how people felt or the emotion they felt during the lockdown. 
And what we will do is to take the measure of fertility desires from the wave before, the wave 11, that was collected in 18 and 19, um, and see if there was change in fertility desires between wave 11 and wave 12 collected in the subsample in late spring and summer of 2020 and see how, how people felt during the lockdown can predict or is associated with the fertility change, the fertility desire change. That's the idea of this analysis. The sample is small that meets the conditions that we need to be met, which is this overlap uh, wave 12 post lockdown sample that also participated in the COVID wave. It's 746 people. And there are some missing, not very many, uh, but there are some. So after list-wise deletion, 704 people is the sample we are left with. This is a very much too small table and I don't want to point your attention to it specifically. Um, uh, just really quickly, this is the this, uh, sample we're working with um, compared to the uh, rest of the people who took the COVID wave because we wanted to see if it's representative. And I would like to point your attention here to, to the age categories because this sample on average is much younger. There are many people in their teens, so uh, later all, all their teenagers. And I should say about the pair farm, they have three birth cohorts. People right now in their, um, in their 20s, early 20s, early 30s, and early 40s. And I don't even know who these young people are. Either it is a sample that came on a refreshment, the placement sample, or it could also be the children of some of the panel members that are now aging. Um, they are at least, I think, aged, oops, 16, sorry. So this sample is relatively young, just to show you that. And with that, of course, comes uh, higher childlessness, and fewer people of those are living with the partner than the rest of the people who answered the COVID wave. We don't think it matters very much. We control for these things later, but we just wanted to show you. So as I said, the central dependent process that we're looking at is a change in the desired number of children. The question is asked in that way, disregarding constraints. How many kids would you ideally like to have? And we created an outcome variable with three outcomes. Either they could have just exactly stayed the same, which is the large majority, about 75%, uh, or they could increase or decrease their, the number of desired children, uh, and increases and decreases about the same, about 12% of the sample increased or decreased the desires. Then the central measures of emotion that we're looking at is like two comes from two questions they asked in the lockdown. The first is in the in the last four weeks, during most of the time, did you uh, um, did you feel? And then there was a variety of emotions listed, and people could for each of those say it does not apply, so it didn't feel that emotion basically at all mo most of the time, or it applies very much. Um, they have some positive emotion too. There's no sadness, unfortunately, but we took these three that we thought are central to our hypothesis, angriness, feeling anxious, or feeling lonely. Then there was a second question that was asked to everyone, which asked about worries, three specific worries. Are you worried right now about any of these? Uh, and then there were three potential worries people could have, your own situ economic situation, your own health, or the health of your relatives, without further specification who was meant here. I'm going to show you some uh, descriptors of, of these, these measures. So this is our emotion measure, uh, feeling anxious, feeling angry, or feeling lonely. And blue means feeling very much of this emotion. This is kind of somewhat, and this is not at all. So you can see that most people did not feel lonely, angry, or anxious, but there was a good chunk specifically among those who felt angry or lonely to certain degrees. We retain the scaling of five outcomes. And then the worry question uh, coded differently. Now very worried is red and here on the left side. You see that not many people were very worried, but there was a good chunk that was got very worried about the health of their relatives and a, a few that were worried about their finances or their own health. And so most people were somewhat worried about the health of relatives, 
and most people were not so worried about their own health or finances, their own finances. One would expect that these things are highly correlated, but they're actually not so highly correlated. Uh, the two health worries, which are worry three and worry two, are somewhat correlated and anxious and angry too, but uh, the, the rest not so much. We conducted principal component analysis because we thought we would perhaps need to summarize these um, outcomes measures in a, in a principal component score, but actually uh, it, it didn't indicate that, that we have to. So we are using these items uh, in a singular way. So now coming back to the theoretical frame and to the specific hypotheses that we are testing here or that we came up with. And it looks a bit confusing. I apologize, I tried to walk you through it. So the effective model is actually the model that we cannot test really well with the data at hand. It would require the people to say how they felt in a very specific situation with the kids at home or with the partner. Um, that is not fully available, or if so, it is only available for a subset of respondents. So we are not working with these measures right now. We are working with the loneliness measure because uh, we argue that feeling lonely with a partner in interaction with having a partner would actually mean uh, the person is not happy with the relationship and it could lead to a decrease in the fertility desire in this moment with this partner. Um, if a person is lonely and is childless, this is more speculation, but it could actually increase the fertility desire because it could uh, create a, a desire for, for having somebody there. And it, it could be a child specifically in this relatively young sample that we're seeing in the, in the sample we have. The terminal investments, we can test that more specifically. We have these measures for generalized anxiety, anger, and we argue that increases in anxiety and anger should directly be associated with increases in the desired number of children. Specifically, um, when uh, we control for health worries, uh, which in and of themselves should also predict increases in the fertility desire. Uh, but beyond this, if we control for health worries and anxiety and anger still predict fertility increases, that is we, we think um, some evidence for the terminal investment hypothesis. Then there could be some interactions going on that one is specifically worried about health and also highly anxious or highly angry that should kind of strengthen the effect. So we would ex still expect to see an increase and a positive interaction between, between these two. Worries about the economy or their own economic situation uh, in contrast should not have an effect at all. Um, we're not so sure here about feeling lonely because this could also be goal activation, so we put a question mark. The uncertainty model is pretty clear. Being worried economically should lead to a decrease in fertility desires. And uh, we argue that actually these emotions after we control for the economic worry should not have an effect at all on, on, um, on the, in terms of the uncertainty model. Uh, we also think there should be interactions going on. So being worried in the economic, regarding the own economic situation and at the same time feeling highly anxious or angry would also create a positive interaction here. Uh, and the same also for health worry because people of course may have been worried about health and the healthcare system and their own health. And if they also feel highly anxious that should decrease the fertility desires in the moment. That's what we argue. Okay, so back to the analysis. Uh, we have a very simplistic analytical strategy for the moment, which is um, we estimate a multinomial model. The outcome, I talked about this already plenty, is a categorical variable with three outcomes. The desired number of children stayed the same, increased or decreased. And in the results I will show you in a minute, this group of people who had the same fertility number desire is going to be the reference group. So I'm going to show you some banks, some uh, coefficients for these two groups in contrast each time to the reference group. The two main predictors we're using are the emotion and, and worry variables as singular items. And we have a couple of basic sociodemographic control variables, age, education, sex, there should be a comma, oops, comma here, uh, whether one has a partner or not, and then childless, yes or no. Um, and I'm going to show you some models with and without controls. 
Okay. So first, we're testing the effective model with the loneliness. And um, you can see here the main effect, which I didn't list in my hypotheses. But as it's pretty obvious, those who decrease the fertility desire with and without controls, it doesn't change. Actually, it's close to zero. So increases in, in feeling lonely are not associated with either decreasing the fertility desire compared with the reference group of those who stay the same, but also not with increasing the fertility desire. There's close to, to no effect here at all. The same is true or when we interact with partner and parenthood status. It's a very simple story. Uh, so we need to reject these hypotheses. But of course, the question is, have we specified and tested this model well? Which I don't think we have, but that's uh, something to discuss later. Let's move on to the terminal investments model. This is now becoming more interesting. So what we see here is um, the coefficient plotted for uh, feeling anxious without any controls. This model is just using the anxiety indicator and not even controlling for basic social demographics. There is a zero coefficient uh, for a decrease in fertility desires, but actually here you see that those um, with increasing anxiety feelings, people were more likely to increase their fertility desire or the number of desired children. When we control for basic demographic characteristics and uh, also add worry one, which is the control for the economic worry, the significance of this effect goes away, but it stays in the same vicinity pretty much here. You also see that once the financial worries are added, it has a insignificant but positive association with decreasing the fertility desire, the number of, uh, of desired children. Once we control uh, not for the worry in terms of economics, but the health worries, uh, we see the same story here. So the effect of anxiety stays even though it goes and uh, includes uh, zero, the confidence interval. Um, but the worry too, which is the worry about relatives, not own, this is own health worry. The worry about relatives also predicts insignificantly so, but has a positive uh, coefficient on increasing the fertility desire. Uh, so this, this would go along. Blue means here the uncertainty model and red refers to the terminal investments. Try to color the boxes accordingly. So here to summarize, now let's focus on the terminal investments first. Uh, these hypotheses are actually confirmed uh, in this first exploratory analysis if we disregard the significant stars for the moment. Feeling more anxious uh, is associated with increasing the fertility desire. Um, and so is the health worry about relatives, not own health. Okay, so, oh, sorry, this is angry. Now we're doing the same thing with feeling angry and we see the same story. Feeling more angry is associated, increases the log odds of being in the increasing group as compared to the staying in the same fertility desire group. So the same story of the significance here in the model that doesn't control for anything which then goes away, but the coefficient stays in the same vicinity once we add social demographic controls and add the, the uh, financial word variable, which is the same story here for the uncertainty model. Um, and we see again, some significance once we don't control for the economic worry, but the health worries. So we conclude that this hypothesis feeling more angry is also uh, is being associated with increases in fertility desire uh, is also, there's some evidence for that. I'm gonna talk about the interaction effects in a bit. First, I'm gonna show you these main effects. So let's move on to the uncertainty model. I already showed you the financial worry in conjunction with the anxiety and angry variables. We wanted to look at it without controlling for other emotions uh, in a model that just uh, adds the worries here on the left side, each of the three, and then adds 
just the social demographic controls no emotion yet because this shouldn't be contingent on other emotions other than perhaps an interaction effect. So uh, we see the same thing. Um, higher levels of, of having worries about the own financial situation is associated um, positively with the decrease in fertility desires, even though the confidence interval includes zero here. Um, but the coefficient gets a bit bigger after we add the sociodemographic controls. There's also the increase um, positive coefficient here uh, for the financial worry, but it gets quite smaller once we add the controls. The health worries um, are associated, uh, as we've seen with this increase, in the fertility desires, so that would not actually um, be in line with the uncertainty hypotheses, even though we focus them on the on the financial worries. But of course, uncertainty in the health realm would also be important. So uh, we think we also find some perhaps weak, but at least some evidence for this uh, economic worry uncertainty hypothesis. Um, but the idea that the emotions should then not, apart from feeling kind of worried about certain social areas or economic areas, predict increases or specifically decreases in the desire, that is, we need to reject that because we've seen this is actually true for anxiety and, and feeling angry and would rather be in line with the terminal investments model. So I wanted to show you some of the interactions. We are still uh, running some models and the evidence is kind of inconclusive. So I wasn't sure if I should even include this, but I'm showing you what we have. What you see here is a model that interacts feeling anxious with the financial worry. And you see plotted the main effects. The red doesn't, it doesn't, shouldn't stand out. It's just showing that this coefficient is, this is odds ratios or relative risk ratios now, no log odds anymore is, is uh, basically negative. That's what it shows. Um, and we again see the like positive association between um, feeling worried in the financial realm and decreasing the fertility desires. And now there's also a bit of a positive association with feeling anxious, but the interaction is negative. And uh, so that means the more worried you feel, but the less anxious, the more likely you are to decrease. We do some predictions, but they are not very conclusive. So um, we don't know, it's a small sample what this means. Perhaps it doesn't mean anything. This is also close to zero, uh, including zero here in the confidence interval. But the, even though the, the, the main effect goes in the direction as expected for the uncertainty model, the interaction with the worries with, uh, with feeling anxious or, or feeling angry, it goes in the wrong direction. So it's negative. So if you have any thoughts on that, or if it's just a chance finding, I'd be happy to hear it. So for the terminal investments, um, it's a similar story. There is the health worry uh, now is main effect is not significant once we add this interaction is here on the positive side, but the interaction is also negative. So it's the same story as for the interactions with the economic worry and the anxiety or anger. It's a, a negative uh, for most of the parts. Interaction effect that is also not significant at all. So we, for the moment, reject all these interactive hypotheses that we had. That's maybe the conclusion for the interactions. Okay. So that's all I wanted to show you. And I see I'm about in time, so that's, that's good. Um, I know it's a lot uh, and I'll try to summarize a bit. So we had this idea in our concept that negative emotion in times of disaster should affect fertility preferences. And we developed three theoretical concepts or ideas of how this association should look like. The effective model that I guess that specific integral emotion in the moment of decision-making tied to a very specific situation should, um, should, should uh, lead, if it's negative, to a decrease in fertility desires. But we had this, so negative specific emotion, that's what this means, tied to child rearing or to the partner or whatever. But 
we can't really test this because the variables we have aren't specific or, or, or good enough to, to, to put this to the test. The second idea was that goal activation is triggered by negative emotion in terms of reproductive investments, leaning on the terminal investments hypothesis. So negative generalized emotion should increase the fertility desires. And then the uncertainty perception, the UM model, the worries for certain life areas, specifically economic ones, should also even in, or more so in interaction with negative generalized emotion predict a decrease in the desires. So that was the idea. And what we found is that there are associations with negative emotion in terms of disaster associated um, with the fertility desire change. We have no evidence to support this effective model, even though it's not sufficiently tested. So I shouldn't have even say that. The terminal investments model, there is some evidence for that. In the, um, in terms of the hypotheses we formulated, which may be debatable. I'm curious to hear what you think. But the interactions are somehow not going in the way we specified or are being counterintuitive. And the same goes for the uncertainty model, at least in terms of the economic uncertainty. That's my summary of the findings. Uh, but of course, I would like to point out plenty of limitations we have and relate back to um, the introduction I made in the beginning. So let me say that these analyses are, of course, very simple. We don't measure fertility. We me measure the desire. It's debatable whether that's a good outcome. We have this very simplistic approach to compare before and after desires uh, without controlling for anything that happened in the lives before of these people and uh, without taking care of unobserved heterogeneity. We have no panel, no fixed term, uh, no fixed effects models. So there could actually be uh, unobserved heterogeneity that bias these results, life circumstances, differences in personality that are intrinsic and stable over time. There could be moderators, uh, all of it. And we plan to use the whole panel structure and run some fixed effects model. But of course, with this very low uh, sample size, it's questionable whether we can even get models uh, that, that converge. We will have to see. That's the idea for the next steps. Um, but for now, we don't have it. So then, of course, there's another question on whether these findings that we have for the moment are unique to the disaster moment. Of course, we measure the emotions in the first lockdown, which is really nice. And we have the before and after design of the desired um, the number of children. But uh, if we would put this to the test in previous waves, perhaps uh, we would have a similar finding. So what are these emotions and why do some people feel more negative than others? And to what is it even related? Is it related to the pandemic? We don't know any of that. So we would have to compare perhaps to pre-pandemic uh, times whether we would find a similar association with the emotion and the fertility desire change, which we would like to do next as well. Then, um, as I said, we don't examine the behavior. We examine the change in desires. It's a whole different question whether the preferences are going to be implemented into real fertility. And perhaps the pandemic is rather affecting fertility via making people not realize the desires they have, or mm, some people may realize desires they don't have by terms of accidental pregnancies. Of course, all of that is not measured here and is something that would come next uh, that people should, should examine. So these are all quite big limitations to our study. Um, and to relate back to, to the question of what actually causes fertility to change after disasters, uh, that is a big question mark. So what does it all mean for fertility change in terms of disaster, we find some associations between emotion measured during a lockdown moment for fertility preference change. But uh, could this actually be somehow related back, even if we now believe that these preferences will be implemented one on one to changes in fertility desire? We don't know. We find more evidence for increases. Right now in Germany, we don't see any decline so far. Uh, we are not seeing an increase either, but how would this uh, emotion change actually look like on a population level? Could we use these measures to predict any fertility change 
we, we don't know any of that. So how useful is it going to be to understand these mechanisms of the fertility response to disasters? Uh, we have no answer for that either.